Hello, here's my homily for the Feast of Pentecost, which is Sunday the 19th of May. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a tendency in our modern world to make a mistaken distinction between things that are spiritual and things that are physical. And so to assume that to call God spirit limits God to spiritual things. You can see its extreme form in Christians who take the phrase from St John's Gospel, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth, to mean that outward forms of worship as used by the church are not of God. Faced with the fact that Jesus actually gave us physical elements in bread and wine as the supreme way to meet him, they claimed and still claim that the outward form has no relation to the inner spiritual reality and that it is the inner spiritual reality that is of God. We get this mistaken idea, this mistaken view too, in the idea that spirituality is a good thing whilst religion is flawed. And so people believe that pursuing their own spiritual path is all that matters. I say all this because as we celebrate the coming to us of God as spirit every Pentecost Sunday, we need to work out much more clearly how the spiritual is actually part and parcel of the physical, just as the physical is part and parcel of the spiritual. An aid to understanding this has been given to us by modern medicine. There was a time when doctors thought that all they had to do was to deal with any disease or damage in our physical bodies, with little or no awareness of the need to treat the whole person, body, mind and spirit, if full healing was to be achieved. There was some talk of the place of what was called the bedside manner in helping people get better, but it was regarded as of little importance, provided the correct physical treatment, the best medicine, could be administered. Gradually, however, very gradually, more and more evidence has shown the medical world that the way patients view themselves, in other words, how they think of themselves and their doctors and nurses spiritually, makes a vital difference to the healing process. I remember the shock I had when I first laid hands for healing on a lady paralysed by a stroke way back in the early 1970s. I had assumed that since my prayers were spiritual, they might well help her spiritually. So I was more than a little astonished to find that my prayer not only helped her spiritually, but had also affected her physically, so that the following day she could walk. St Paul, in our second reading, his letter to the Galatians, makes it quite clear that how we behave physically, for good or ill, depends on whether we allow God as Spirit to work in us. So he writes that what the Spirit brings is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness and self-control. All the things on this list are basically a mixture of spiritual and physical. It's no good saying we have love or kindness or gentleness if they do not show up in us physically, in what we actually do. To say I am a kind person or a loving person or a gentle person without putting into practice these virtues is the height of hypocrisy. But it seems to me that the last of these gifts from the Spirit, the one St Paul calls self-control, is the one most often misunderstood and so requires further examination. You see, too often self-control is seen through the moralistic eyes of the 19th century in which showing too much emotion was to be avoided at all costs. Men who started to weep or women who started to scream were told sharply to control themselves. 
But this is not what St. Paul means by self-control, because for him it's not a negative thing, but something very positive. It's about learning how God the Holy Spirit enables us to focus our God-given talents in an appropriate way. The musician uses it to focus his energy on making beautiful music, the engineer on creating a great bridge, and the footballer on scoring that brilliant goal. Indeed, when such people do behave in this way, in a way that is self-controlled so that their energy is focused, we sometimes describe them as being inspired. And of course, the, the word inspired originally meant being in inspired, that is, filled with the Holy Spirit. This talk of music takes us back to my Bay point, the way the physical and the spiritual have a vital relationship with one another. I love watching the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition, not just so that I can be impressed by young people making beautiful music, but because the judges explain that it's not enough for these competitors to be technically accurate. They have to have something more. And they explain this something more by talking about the young musician's relationship to the music. They say they are looking for those people where somehow they and the music they perform become one. The judges are looking, I would argue, for those who express the music spiritually, who live in the music they are performing rather than just producing it physically. Music is such a good example here because when it is played beautifully, it affects us spiritually. It's why I often use the well-known phrase that to sing is to pray twice. The focusing of the spiritual through the physical is at the heart of all the sacraments as Catholics know only too well. But of course, non-Catholic Christians are wary of this talk of sacraments, of these outward signs. When they do so, I always point them to the outward sign they are most likely to use themselves, the one where they lay hands on someone to pray for healing. They will usually agree that the physical touch enhances the power of the healing prayer. In other words, God works spiritually through things that are physical. It's worth remembering that the sacrament of anointing the sick includes first the priest silently laying his hands on the sick person and only then anointing on the forehead and the palms of the hands. Looked at this way, it is not so surprising that when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in the upper room, as we heard in our first reading, they do not just receive spiritual support, but feel this support physically with sound and fire and thereafter are changed from huddling in fear to going out into the world to proclaim the faith and, if necessary, to die in the process. So may God Almighty bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.